Well, good morning, everybody. Wow, you guys are still tired. I said, good morning. We're in the house of the Lord together. Very good. Very good. Guys, it's so good to always come back here and being able to have the privilege to just read God's words with each other and just really kind of talk about the next step within this series of King David, right? Um, You know, our main text that we're going to be looking at, if you have your Bibles with you, is going to be 2 Samuel chapter 12. And so really, we're going to look at this whole entire chapter as we've looked through David's life together through this series. And really, when it comes to this chapter 12, I'm not going to read the whole entire chapter because it's a long chapter, so we'll get into that in a little bit. But really, what the main point of this text is telling us about is God is kindly ready to restore David into repentance of his sins, right? It's without gospel repentance, sin always spirals, but God in his kindness restores us by bringing us to repentance of our sins. So a little recap, right? Because honestly, this this, uh, sermon is really part two from last week. So part one of last week, we talked about, you know, the spiral of sin and seeing what David had done. And we really dove into a very deepening, you know, Bible story, uh, when it comes to King David, you know, this is David who had fought, you know, the, the giant that is Goliath, right? This is David, the king who had written so many Psalms and really that has just a book of wisdom and praise and how we are to see God and his goodness and his kindness. But this time he messed up pretty bad. So little overview of what happened, right? David, you know, neglected his duties as king, is going into the armies, going into where the battlefield was, because that's what kings did back in the day. And he saw this woman named Bathsheba, and he really wanted to be with her. Even though God gave you really, you know, red flags saying, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you the lineage of Bathsheba because you know her grandfather, you know her father, you know her husband, and not only do you know them, you know them so well that they're your trusted warriors, your trusted counsel. Don't do this, David. He's giving them flashing saying, do do not go forward. But yet he already does what he wants to do. He ended up committing adultery with her, and then Bathsheba tells him, hey, I'm pregnant. And so David goes into a complete panic, right? This is going, instead of coming clean, he's trying to cover it up with his husband, right? There's three attempts in there. He says, hey, let me take you from the battlefield, Uriah. Go be with your wife. He says, no, I am not going to be with my wife and my family when my people, when my brothers from, ad, you know, from adversary of the battlefield are still fighting and sleeping in tents. And so David goes, all right, attempt number two. All right, let's get him into the feast, right? Let's get him like saying, just stay one more night. Let's get you, let's get you comfortable here, right? So he goes into this festival, he gets Uriah drunk, and he's like, I got him. I know I've lowered his wall down. He's gonna be in, you know, he's gonna go to his wife and he's gonna lay with her. Doesn't happen, right? Uriah goes to the servant's uh, household and is able to say, you know what? I'm just gonna sleep here instead. And so the third and final attempt, it says, all right, fine. If you're not going to help cover up my sin and you're not going to help cover up my responsibility and my problem, all right, fine. You're going to die. And he places in Uriah's hand the deed to carry out his death. And so Uriah, even being a good soldier, does not look at this piece of paper. He gives it to the general. The general reads it. And you've got to be thinking to yourself, did, did Uriah just really give me his death warrant? And as a good general, he, he carries out the king's order because he knows the consequences of what he does if he doesn't carry it out. And so Uriah is killed. And this is just how David's way of trying to hide what he did wrong makes things worse. And so we learned that, you know, with sin, doing things that God says it's not right and it's wrong starts with the little steps, right? It starts with neglect. It starts with lingering. It starts with action, and then more action to cover up that action. And then if you keep going down the spiral of sin, it's going to lead to death. And he shows us that if we don't turn back, it will lead to death and unfavorness from God. And so when we ignore what's right, just like David ignored his duties as king, he lingered, he did things that he shouldn't have done. And you're thinking to yourself, Is this really going to lead to the death? No. Because here's the good news, right? We talked about the spiral of sin last week, but we also said, hey, we're going to talk about how to get out of that. And the good news is that even though David's sin spiraled out of control and he has to ask himself, how did I get here? God's offering a way out. When we mess up, 
We need to, you know, we need to repent. We need to know what repentance is, and we need to admit what we did was wrong, and we need to turn back to God. And so when sin, uh, sin spirals, and if we don't repent and we don't turn to God, we can't have any hope. So we're talking about repentance, right? And that's the way out of, you know, the sin spiral. But you're asking, you say, hey, preacher, what is repentance, right? I'm looking at that video that we just looked at. I'm like, that's a good inclination of saying, hey, I can explain to this to a six-year-old or a sixth grader, and they can get the grasp of it, right? So I'm thinking to myself, okay, what is repentance like? And how can I put it in the most simplest of form? Well, we talk about first, you got to recognize you're wrong. How many people like actually knowing that they're wrong and admitting it, right? I know I don't. I mean, my wife will tell you that all day long. I don't like to say that I'm wrong, but in the end, I'm like, hey, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Right? <laughs> it's one of those things that I hate admitting when I'm wrong, but you have to do it to restore the relationship, to restore what you've done wrong. And so it starts with recognition, and this means admitting when you do with something wrong, and it's finally accepting cutting corners, right? It's teenage Kyle accepting the fact and finally saying, hey, I did cut corners in pre-calculus class. Now, how I even got admitted to pre-calculus class is a miracle within its own. But the reason why I cut corners and I had the Val Victorian kind of sit right next to me for some different guidance on answers, because my grandparents said, hey, if you can get this F to a B, you can trade in your truck, your little Ford Ranger that's falling apart, and you can get your Ford Mustang. I said, there is no way I'm not getting that Mustang. I am 16, 17 years old, and you're saying I can have a Mustang? I'm going to do whatever it takes. Now, granted, I finally admitted doing wrong, but it wasn't until 10 years later. You know, I told my grandma, I said, hey, remember that time, like, I miraculously went to F to a B in pre-college. She's like, yes. And I knew that if you really applied yourself, you could do anything. And I'm like, about that. Kind of cut quarters. And she goes, are you kidding me right now? I said, no. She goes, I don't know whether to be mad at you right now or to be impressed that you got away with it. You know, with even you mean your granddad checking into it. I was like, well, call what you this. I've repented. I've let you know I'm off the hook, right? And so, but what's lacking within there was the, the, the feeling of genuine regret, right? I, did, I didn't feel much regret within there. I was like, you know what? I'm not regretting this. I've got a Mustang. This is great. But when it's true repentance, repentance revolves feeling genuine regret. It's not about guilt tripping yourself, but having a real sense of remorse, and it's not about the grief aspect of having repentance where you're like, oh, I'm going to lose this, this, and this. No, this is a gospel-centered repentance that says, I have done wrong in the eyes of the Lord, and I must turn back to him. You realize the impact and actions, and so you confess to God your sins. You confess the wrongdoings, and this means being honest of what you did, and even being honest of your intentions and in really within your own feelings about what you sinned. Right? You're like, Lord, I should have had more conviction about that, but I did it. And I'm sorry because I've read your word. I know what to do wrong. And I know that the heart is wicked. And my heart was so wicked that I didn't even feel sorry for what I did. But you have to ask forgiveness. You open to God. And then you choose about, hey, changing your ways. You got to decide going from wrong behavior to right behavior. And so, when I really kind of got the sense of repentance was really going to the ancient Hebrew and Greek. I know you're like, great, this nerd is going to give us this word that we can't even pronounce and talk about the meaning of it. Yes, I am. So within the Hebrew, right, the Hebrew word of repentance is shove, right, to shove. Uh, this word, and it's not shove and like shoving people all the way back. No, this word literally means to turn or to return. It's like turning around from a wrong path and you keep going in this wrong direction and you say, you know what? I was wrong. I need to make a U-turn, right? I need to go back to the point of contact. I need to go back to God and go back to this rate in narrow ways that he's prepared for me. The Greek word, right, goes to metanoa. Now, you got meta, I got noah. Yes, meta is not just Facebook, okay? This is an actual Greek word. That means to change, right? And synoia, when it comes to the mind, it literally means the change of the mind. So if we are to take a U-turn with the Greek Hebrew, we know within the Greek it is to help change our mind on how we feel about this. And so really, when we talk about repentance, I want to talk about two types of repentance here, 
Okay, the one that we're gonna see throughout this whole entire sermon, the other one I'm gonna give you a brief description of. But this is really driven from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 10, where he says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death, right? So within David, what we're gonna see here, we're gonna see gospel-centered repentance. But if you go back into 1 Samuel chapter 15, you see that within Saul, Saul had a grief-driven repentance. And so what I mean about that is that Saul's repentance was driven by the sorrow and fear of losing his kingdom, the fear and sorrow of what he felt like he inherited his own right, the fear and sorrow of his reputation and what he's built. He wasn't caring about what he actually turned away from God for. No, he cared about what he had he'd built. He cared about his kingdom and not God's kingdom. And so when he expresses regret and sorrow over losing his kingship, he doesn't fully acknowledge the gravity of his disobedience to God's command. And so we see that, that unfolding. Saul didn't experience lasting spiritual, spiritual restoration with God. His repentance was more about the consequences he faced rather than genuine turning to God. And so we know that without gospel repentance, sin always spirals. But God in his kindness restores us by bringing us to repentance of our sin. I want that to be driven. Yes, we talked about the sin spiral. We're talking about repentance. I really want you to lean in when it comes to this gospel repentance in this series, because this is the hope, not only that had restoration with David, but it's the hope that we could have each and all of our lives. And so when it comes to gospel driven repentance, there's really two parts. There's really two points on this. There's God's pursuit of us and us pursuing God. And so when we look at about God pursuing of us, you're like, Hamby, what does that look like? Where have you seen that within the Bible? Well, I'll tell you. It's Romans chapter two, verses four, where it states, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience? Here's the key phrase, right? Not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you in repentance. Did you get that? right? The God's kindness that leads you into repentance. This is not to the point of saying, oh, you're going to go in repentance on your own. No, it's because of God's character. It's because of God's nature. It's because of God's kindness that leads you into repentance. And so God pursues us through his relentless love and grace, persistently drawing us back to him despite our failures and our shortcomings. But his pursuit is founded on compassion forgiveness, and a desire for restored relationship. And so even going before repentance, like God loves you so much, it is rooted in forgiveness. It's rooted in love. It's rooted in kindness that he will give you warning signs, just like he did with David. Like if I'm David, granted, when I pray about something about God's will, I said, God, please hit it over the head with me like a hammer, because if I'm just going to search for it, I'm going to miss it. And so God presents it in, in such a way when he comes to David saying, hey, listen, you shouldn't miss this. This is the lineage. This is the people that served you. But yet he still goes. And so because he, he just disregards God's warning signs, all of a sudden we see Nathan come back in the picture, right? Nathan being Daniel's, or sorry, uh, David's friend. And really he begins to tell a parable about, you know, rich man and a poor, who takes a poor man's beloved lamb. So 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses one through six. Let's look at it together. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he had bought. And he bought it up. And he grew it up and he made him and it was with his children and his family. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man as he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for a guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and he prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against this man. And he says to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing 
and because he had no pity. So, right, we're seeing David being outraged and declares this rich man to be put to death. And it's like, how dare this rich man do what he's doing? He has sinned before the Lord and I can't believe it, dude. I'm so mad. But then all of a sudden, Nathan goes, you are the man, right? In, in the, our generation's terms, he goes, you idiot. I'm telling you a story that you are a character of that story. You are that rich man. Seven through eight, Nathan says to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I have delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into the arms. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this was too little, I would add to you as much more. I mean, this has got to be to a point, if I'm David, I am just completely just sheepish, like no pun intended, right? I am sheepish, and I'm going to the point of saying, crap. I, I have been so neglecting of the world around me. I have put my blinders on, I have tunnel vision, and I haven't even seen that the story that's coming from my friend is about me, and he's telling me this because he loves me. And so he goes into the point and said, listen, God can change our hearts and mind. And he does that with, with Nathan. And he, you know, God's message through Nathan, Nathan recounts God's blessing on David and confronts him for despising God's word. Verse nine, right? Why, you ha why have you despised the word of the Lord? Right? This is David. This is, the, this is David that says, I meditate on the word of the Lord both day and night, and I will keep it in my heart forever. No, he says, why have you despised the word of the Lord? To do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hey, you have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Mennonites. So not only does he give you this parable, right? He's saying, hey, listen, this is you. Oh, you still don't get it? I'm just gonna call it out for you. You are that rich man. And to go a step further, I know what you did with Bathsheba and Uriah. And I know you have no remorse for it. And so it goes into the point of the importance of God's word, right? Because how can you know sin? How do you know repentance if you can't be in God's word? Because David had forgotten God's word. He had forgotten that God's laws are not just rules, but reflection of his character. God is love, God is justice, God is mercy. And Nathan's words are like a wake-up call. It reminds David of what he have overlooked. And that this wasn't just about breaking rules. It was about breaking trust with God. And you know, see, being in God's word, it's just not about reading stories or memorizing verses when it comes to us. And it's about knowing God's heart and understanding his ways. And in the light, letting our truth guide our lives because we know that the word is truth in our life and we are guided from it. So when Nathan confronted David, he didn't just point out David's sin. He pointed David to, back to God's word, right? He said, listen, go back to the word. Keep back meditating day and night like you said you were going to. But just know consequences were still gonna come. Nathan declares that the sword will never depart from David's house, that his wife will be taken, and his actions will be publicly exposed. And it's because of that, God starts to open our, you know, our eyes to the reality of it. And when God exposes our, our blindness to sin, that are these scales of sin that have fallen out, and we're able to see what God is doing within our lives, what he has done in our lives, and what, what he will continue to do, we have to go to the word of God. And when we look at that, then, then when it comes to gospel centered repentance, can we talk about our pursuit to God? Right? There's different stages when it comes to the pursuit of God in, in repentance, right? And the first and foremost is, it's just the reckoning of sin, right? Understanding the gravity, the weight, the, the consequences that will come when it comes to sin, right? This is deception and concealment for David when he attempted to hide his sin through manipulation and murder. But God's knowledge of sin brings to light any attempt that we have at concealment. And so David thought he had kept his sin hidden from everyone. But God saw everything, right? He always does. And Nathan's words 
echo God's omniscience and saying, I am all knowing. I have that nature of that. And I see the depths into your heart. It shows that no matter how hard we try to cover up our mistakes and even justify it or cover it up, God always knows the truth, right? How many of y'all know Johnny Cash? Raise your hands, right? Okay, good. I was hoping I was like maybe half and half. I'm a country guy. I love country. And there was an album made by Johnny Cash later in his life. And as you know, Johnny Cash, right, he really did some gospel singing, right, goes into the presence and do that. There was one song that always just echoed my mind in this part one and part two of this series. And it's uh, sooner or later, God's going to cut you down, right? He says, you know, you can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, God's going to cut you down. What you've done in the dark will be brought to the light. And it's so true. Every single time, we know this. Every t- single time we take our sin and we put it into ourselves and say, no, I'm not letting anybody have this because I am ashamed of it and I will not repent of it. God says, bring it before me. It's going to be brought to light no matter what. So you can take the easy way or the hard way. David chose the hard way, right? But the hope of that is the repentance and forgiveness. Chapters 13 through 15. Oh, sorry, verses 13 through 15. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who was born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's Uriah's wife bore David, and he became sick, right? This is into a point of just the dire consequences of his sin. But the thing is, David first deals with confession. He has that admission of guilt. He acknowledges, I have sinned against the Lord. I am sorry. And he, you know, David doesn't make excuses to blame others now right? After the reality of his sin has really struck him into the heart, not only from God, but God's messenger through Nathan, he says, I'm not going to make excuses anymore. I'm not going to blame others. I'm going to admit my sin directly and recognize my wrongdoing, not just against Uriah and Bathsheba, but against God himself. And it's this step that we can understand the seriousness of our actions in light of God's holiness. And really, unlike Saul, Saul's, you know, always coming up with excuses. And David shows genuine repentance, setting the model for true gospel repentance. And really, when it comes to one of the Psalms that David had written, you can see the true heart of the nature of where he saw his sin and how he's going to see, how can I get the repentance? How can I repent to the Lord and say, please don't let me die. I am so sorry for what I did. I see the true nature of offending the Lord Almighty. Psalm 51. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth into iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth and inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me of my hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face away from my sins. Blout out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, And take not only your your Holy Spirit from me, but restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me in the willing spirit. Then I will teach 
transgressors your ways and sinners to return to you. Deliver me from the blood guiltness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and consecrated heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and the whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered into your altar. Right? This is, this is the heart of David. This is really kind of seeing David and saying, Lord, listen, this is my true heart, Lord. I'm sorry. This is a love letter. This is a letter of saying, I'm sorry, Lord, that I have offended you so much. Please forgive me. And now we can see within the true heart of the, really at the epicenter of what gospel-centered repentance looks like. He has assurance of forgiveness when he says, the Lord has taken away, when Nathan tells David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. And it's only because by the grace and mercy of God, the true repentance leads to true forgiveness. But we kind of talked about the consequences, right? We see the child's death. Despite forgiveness, the consequences of David's sin was the death of Bathsheba's child. So many times we tell ourselves that, hey, I'm forgiving of my sins. Does that mean the consequences go away? We know that. How many of us got in trouble with our mom and dads and fessed up to it, said, I've done wrong, but we still got grounded or we still got a spanking, right? Because the consequences are still there. There's a difference between condemnation and consequence. And I'm going to just spend a little time on this because it's so important. Condemnation is the divine judgment and eternal punishment for sin. It's the ultimate separation from God. And it's reserved for those that do not accept God's forgiveness, right? The consequences, on the other hand, are just earthly outcomes or repercussions of your actions. And they can affect us physically, emotionally, relationally. And they usually are just the ripple effect, the butterfly effect, the, the whatever domino of that first action that we took. And so with David's experience here, condemnation is removed, right? Verse 13 says, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not gonna die. You see, when when David repented, Nathan assured him that God was not only taken his way, his sin, but you will not fear death anymore. It isn't to the point that this shows that David was free from condemnation from sin, and which is the gospel context, meaning to be freed from an internal separation from God. But consequences will still remain. Verse 14 says, but because by their doing, they have shown utter contempt for the Lord and the born and the son born to you will die. You still got to face the consequences of David. The child became ill and died. And David's family experienced turmoil and strife as a result of his sin. Just remember the key difference here is condemnation is eternal. Consequences are temporary. Condemnation affects our eternal standing before God because without repentance and faith in Christ, we are going to experience an eternal separation from the Lord. Consequences occur just in our earthly life and it can affect us in so many different ways. But remember, condemnation is removed by forgiveness but consequences often remain. Condemnation reflects God's character and judgment and holiness. And the penalty for rejecting that and against him is internal separation. There's some biblical examples about consequences after forgiveness, right? We've seen this with Moses, right? In Numbers 20, verses 12, despite his faithfulness, Moses disobeyed God at the waters. And although he was forgiven, he faced the consequence of never entering the promised land. We know this. We saw with Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times, but yet he was forgiven and he was restored. And he also faced the guilt and shame of his actions until Jesus reinstated them. 
We saw this with, with Paul, formerly Saul, right? Persecuted Christians before his conversion and through forgiveness, and he was transformed. He carried the memory of his past actions, which shaped his humility and dedication to spreading the gospel. But here's the thing. When we ask for forgiveness, and we kind of have to just accept the consequences that comes, through that, we have restoration and renewal. You know, David had prayed for this child and he fasted about him. And then he dies. And then this is, this is his response to the child's death in verses 20 through 23. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house. And when he was asked, they set food aside before him and he ate. And this servants said to him, what is this thing that you have done? You fasted, you've wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child dies, you will rise, you eat food? David says, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No. I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. David is worshiping God. He's resuming his normal life, but he has this acceptance of God's will. He, dis- he really discusses the peace that he's found in the submission to God's sovereignty and hope for an eternal reunion. But then in verses 24 through 25, Bathsheba, who has been treated so wrong by David, especially from the beginning of being ripped away from her husband, she comforts him. She comforts him and they say, hey, guess what? We're going to have another son. And his name is going to be Solomon, who is loved by the Lord. Now, if I'm David, if I've gone into a point where I have gone you know, far away from God and I have shown his, his actions toward me, rightfully so, because I have sinned, but now I'm going to have another son and I know that he's going to be loved by the Lord. If I'm David, I'm writing down stuff saying, son, do not forget this. Do not forget the Lord our God. Do not forget his character. Do not forget what he can do, both within your sin and through your sin. Do not forget. And then, through his restoration, David has his military success, and he returns to power. Right? He has a, a victory over Rabbah, and David leads his army to the victory of the Ammonites and reinstating his authority and his kingship. He's building back trust again. And really, this is a symbolic restoration of David's kingship and God's blessing despite past failures. You know, David's story doesn't end with his sin. God's forgiveness through coupled with consequences that could be hard brings restoration. It's one of those things I keep thinking about within James chapter one, when we're talking about the importance of trials and that could be because of our sin. We're not trying to be Job's friend, right? We're not trying to say, you have something bad done to you. You've done something wrong, right? But in this sense with David, that's correct. We want God to change our circumstance, but we don't really want to know if God's kind of trying to change us through our circumstances. It doesn't end with sin. It's shown that God's forgiveness is similarly our hope and restoration that we can have in forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So you want to know how to break the the sin spiral? You want to know what's kind of rooted within this gospel-centered repentance? Jesus came to break the spiral. He broke the spiral of sin in our lives. And through his sacrifice, he offers us a way out of our sinful patterns and the internal condemnation. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. That has got to be the best good news and the best hope that we can have. I know Justin had probably talked about It's not about if you're in the spiral of sin, but where you are in the spiral of sin. 
And it's because of what Christ Jesus has done for us that we can get out of that spiral of sin through gospel-centered repentance. Not grief-driven. Not saying, please, Lord, help save me because the kingdom, my job will go ahead and disband. My family will not like me anymore. My wife might have a different view of me, Lord. My congregation, my friends, my pastor will look at me differently. That's not the truth. That's not the truth at all. Christ died to cover past sins, current sins, and future sins. Let me tell you something. Some of you need to be reminded of that. You're in that spiral of sin saying, I'm so ashamed. That's the enemy talking. He tells you not to repent for sins. He tells you not to bring it open to an accountability group. He tells you not to share it with your spouse or with your pastor because the shame and guilt that you have from it. But Jesus says, I died and covered your sins blotted out your iniquities, as David had asked. And it's through repentance that we can be restored by God. Just as David was restored in the kingship, in Christ we are given a new beginning. Let me tell you something. If you don't know anything about that, come talk to me. Come talk to Kevin. Talk to any brother or sister in Christ in here. They'll tell you how Jesus saved them. It's not to the point that we don't sin again because we are broken and sinful creatures. But it's that gospel sinner repentance, that coming out of that sin spiral, I look at myself, I say, God, let me get back into the word. Let me go ahead and put roadblocks in the way so I don't do that again. Because it's not to the point of my kingdom will fall. I do not want to offend the one that has given me life. Repentance will give you a transformed life. And embracing the gospel means accepting God's forgiveness and finding peace, even when you're in the consequences of your past actions. Like David, who worshiped God after his child's death, and that has to be so hard. I have a child of my own. I could not think how I would begin to act if my child died. But David is still praising even in the storm of the consequences. He knows that God is still with him, but he knows that he's going through this consequence. He's going through the storm. He's going through the trial. He is seeing this death, and he's not going through it alone. Because God's word tells us, I am with you. I am with you. Remember that without gospel sin or repentance, sin will always spiral. Might be too corny words, but it's the most powerful words that I can ever think of. But God, in his infinite kindness, for whatever reason that we can't even comprehend, he pursues us and he wants to bring us to repentance. He forgave us through Jesus Christ, breaking the cycle of sin and showing us the next steps of renewal and reconciliation. David's journey from sin to repentance and restoration mirrors our own journey. Let's embrace the kindness of God that leads us to repentance and pursue him with a heart transformed of the gospel. I pray that we may live in the light of God's goodness and graciousness, continually turning to him in repentance and finding our hope and restoration in Christ. Let's pray. Father, are so thankful for you. Lord, even when we are the rich man in the parable that Nathan brings to David, you still love us. You still pursue us. 
Lord, with that imagery. There's no way we can even think that we deserve or that we're entitled to this. But God, you still love us. Even how much we mess up even how much we just conceal it to ourselves, our sin, and say, I'm not in a sin spiral. I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'm going to put on a mask. And when somebody asks me how I'm truly doing, I'm just going to say, I'm fine. God, you still pursue us, even when we're lying to others and lying to ourselves. But Lord, we anchor ourselves in the hope that you've given us. We anchor in the examples you have brought before us through King David's life. The Lord, even though that we are in a spiral of sin, you forgave us. You've shown us the way for gospel centered repentance. And Lord, as us of your children who have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord. We thank you. Lord, help renew us. Help restore us. For those of you that don't have a relationship with Christ, I pray that you can see having the scales of sin just drop before you, that God is still pursuing you to change your ways because he loves you. He wants to restore that relationship. And he says, I want to call you a child of mine. We have to pursue him in repentance as well. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.